Today is 17th November 1942. Yesterday we had the first snowfall, and a white blanket now covers the steppe as far as the eye can see. It seems as if everything around is muffled. Even the rumble of battle is barely audible when the wind carries the sound over to us. Last night a few soldiers came back from Stalingrad. I'm glad to see that the sickly Stabsgefreiter Petsch is among them. It's obvious that he wasn't much use at the front, owing to his nervous condition. The unit has suffered a lot more casualties. These include Unter of Fieser Seifert, who's been badly wounded and has a splinter in his leg. Domscheid apparently was extremely lucky, according to another soldier. A bomb took his helmet off and the only injury he suffered was a cut from his chin strap. A fellow standing no more than two meters away was blown into the air. The only things left of him were individual body parts, which they gathered up in a ground sheet. In the evening, we have a chat with Mainhardt about the general situation as far as it has affected us. It is more a mishmash of rumors, assumptions, and hopes that things will turn out in our favor. He's been drinking again. I can smell it on his breath. And he is therefore much more communicative. Warias is rubbing his back against a beam, and the noise he makes is so loud that we turn to look at him. We've all used lice powder, and we've even boiled our underwear, but it only helps for a while. Seidel inadvertently crashes into the back of another soldier, who sprawls headlong onto the floor. Seidel helps him to his feet and mutters some excuse or other. We haven't seen the soldier with the chevron before, but before anyone can say anything else, Meinhard bellows, Hey, Sweena, where on earth have you come from? I thought you were at the front with the others. He in turn clutches his throat and croaks something unintelligible. He is short and quite chubby. He's got a scarf round his neck and a cap on his head, which he has pulled down so far that it almost covers his somewhat dangly ears. He goes over to Meinhard at the table, and our eyes follow him in curiosity. When he takes his cap off, I get the feeling that everyone is kind of smirking. Even I can hardly hold it back. The name Sweena brings to mind the image of the grunting creature whose meat we haven't had for a while, especially with his chubby pink cheeks and little red eyes, which look at us from beneath bristling white eyebrows. He has a rounded, good-natured, almost comical face, with a mop of straw-colored hair on top. Sweena offers Meinhard his hand. He motions to his scarf and grunts. Got a bad throat, can barely speak. Wachtmeister Romicat sent me to the rear to recover. That was very sensible of him. How long have you been here? Asks Meinhard. What? Grunts Sweena, stretching his head forward like a bird. Meinhard pulls Sweena towards him and speaks directly into his ear. How long have you been here? For an hour. Was supposed to come here to the fourth squadron, but the truck crashed. Had to wait all day before we could get a tow. Did anyone else come with you? Meinhard speaks right into Sweena's ear. Yes, Gorny and Kirstein. What, they're both here? exclaims Meinhard in delight. The chubby gefreiter nods, but he looks dejected and barely audibly explains. Gorny only lost a bit of his arm, but Kirstein was killed outright, a shell splinter. They brought him to the cemetery straight away. Meinhard must have known the dead soldier very well. He says in a thick voice, bloody Stalingrad. Soon there won't be any of the old fellows left. Now Fritz is gone, and he always believed that nothing could ever happen to him. We were together for a month, once his rifle was shot out of his hand, and shortly after that a splinter tore open the side of his helmet. But he was quite convinced that no Russian bullet would ever have his name on it. He would die in his bed, an old man. Nothing would persuade him otherwise, despite the fact that many of our friends were falling around us. And now it has happened, old chum. Even though you never thought it could, Meinhard mutters to himself. He starts sucking on his pipe and blowing out clouds of smoke. Sweena sits on the bench, staring into the flickering light of the improvised petrol lamp which was put in our bunker yesterday. Some clever individual takes wine bottles half full of petrol and sticks a cartridge case with two holes in the side up through the cork. The gas which escapes up through the cartridge case is ignited and burns evenly, lighting up the bunker better than the usual Hindenburg candles, which are in short supply anyway. It's all a bit depressing here in the bunker right now. The faces around me no longer look carefree and unconcerned. We've heard about the heavy casualties and also about the problems that exist resupplying the troops, particularly over the last few days. The Russians in the meantime are reported to have increased their strength considerably along the Volga. What does it look like at the front? We hear Meinhard asking Sweena. Sweena doesn't understand the question and cups his hand to his ear. The man must be almost deaf and realizing this, everybody glances at everyone else. Meinhard speaks more loudly, directly into Sweena's ear. What's it look like up at the front? Worse and worse, Sweena croaks. Two days ago, two mortars in our sector were lost. We've only got one now in our battle group. Spies has told me that already, says Meinhard. Then he bends forward and says in a loud voice, Hey, it gets worse with you all the time. Last time we were together, at least you could hear better. Sweena points to his throat. It's because of my throat. 
What does his throat have to do with deafness, we wonder? Meinhard is thinking exactly the same thing. More to us than to Sweena, he says. What do you mean, your throat? They should be packing you off home when you are this deaf. I don't understand why they are always sending you back up to the front lines. By the way, which bunker are in? The first one, with the young submachine gun blokes, croaks Sweena, but I don't like it there. We look at each other and Meinhard smiles. These fellows spray everything, he says, but they don't like it when you tell them that. The chubby Sweena shifts uneasily. Scratching himself and shrugging his shoulders, he croaks, that's what everyone tells the new boys. We all laugh. Do you want to come into our bunker? Meinhard again has his mouth close to Sweena's ear and at the same time is looking at us. We nod. Why not? It's big enough. If we pull our stuff a bit closer together, we can get another two in. Sweena says yes to the question and looks up at us. Okay, go get your stuff. You can stay here, says Meinhard out loud. The chubby little gefreiter grins and trots like a walking flower bag out of the bunker. If it were not so tragic, this whole incident would have been comical. Meinhard says that he cannot understand how Sweena could have got into the army in the first place. In the summer, he tells us, Sweena came to the Schwedron with a group of returning convalescents. He couldn't hear very well even then. At first, people thought that he was being antisocial because he never answered anyone's questions. But then it was realized that he couldn't even hear the shells screaming overhead and had to be pulled to safety at the last moment. His deafness became even worse after a shell exploded right next to him. So he can't do very much. Most of the time, he's been bringing up ammunition stocks and fetching rations, and for these tasks, he has been absolutely dependable. He seems to get a little bit anxious when he is at the front, but this is only because of his hearing difficulties. Sweena is certainly not a coward. Meinhard puffs away at his pipe. He only actually lets it go out when he's asleep. He fumbles around under the table, pulls out a half-empty bottle, and takes a long swig. In the dark, I hadn't even noticed it was there. Why do you call him Sweena? Grommel wants to know. Very simple. That's his name, laughs Meinhard. What? I thought it was a nickname, Warius retorts, surprised. Well, it's not his full name. We've shortened it, actually. His full name is Johann Swinowski. So, that's the way it is. Outside, someone is kicking up a racket at the entrance, and then Sweena comes waddling back in. He is carrying his kit bag, and he's got some blankets under his arm. Seidel shows him to the spot beside Meinhard, which he has cleared for him. The night passes quietly. Once in a while, I wake up as I subconsciously hear a new noise in the bunker, which turns out to be a satisfied grunt. 18 November. The night is cold and frosty. I have dressed for warmth for my guard duty with a scarf round my neck. The frost bites at my ears. With each step, the frozen snow crunches under my boots. I think about home and about going skiing in the glistening winter sun with its crunchy snow. I was a good skier and could often make around 30 meters at our ski jump. Here in the step, everything is flat, as it is on our lake. In order to reach our ski jump, we would have to cross the frozen lake on skis for about three kilometers. By that time, we would have worked up a pretty good sweat. Those were wonderful times. As I do on so many clear nights, I am staring up into the night sky. I am searching for the little bear and tracing up to the pole star to find north. I have at least a general idea of the direction where home is. I can often hear, even late at night, Unteroffizier During on his harmonica, playing his favorite tune, Home, Your Stars. Tonight During is the duty NCO and is making his rounds of the bunker area. He also leads our combat training. He's a real old timer released from his service at the front to give us training. We have no problem with him and have learned a lot from him. Not exercises, but first-hand experience in trench training. 19, 10 November. Towards morning, the wind picks up. The weather is hazy and light snow clouds are moving over the steppe. Meinhard tells us that he has to return to Stalingrad today. The Spies told him so yesterday. He'll drive over with winter. It is also his turn to go. Ah, well says Meinhard, reflectively. That's life. True, says Couret, but it could take a hundred years. Could be, agrees Meinhard, but I don't want to grow that old. I shall be quite happy if I can survive this bloody war. You will, says Grommel with conviction. We all want to give him a bit of courage, but we probably fail, 
as Meinhard doesn't talk much after this. He is smoking even more than usual. Then he sits down and writes a letter home. The next drill is after lunch, so until then we get busy cleaning our weapons and getting all our equipment in order. As we report to our formation, something is different in our bunker area. Drivers are running backwards and forwards and are busy with their vehicles. A courier scurries around on his motorcycle and disappears in the direction of the Kolkos. We also have to wait longer than usual for the Spies to show up. Something is happening. But what? We look at each other. Our neighbors from the next bunker don't know anything either. Then the Spies arrives with maps in his hands. He tells us, not beating about the bush, that we are now at the highest state of alert because the Russians have attacked the left flank of the front with strong tank units and broken through the Romanian lines around Kletskaya. The entire Romanian front has reportedly caved in, with the remnants fleeing in the direction of Kalach. Shit! I hear one of our instructors exclaim. The Spies waters down our first shock by telling us that steps have already been taken to start pushing the Russians back. Our tanks and air force have already engaged them. More we are not told. Meinhard tells us later that he and Winter will not be sent back into Stalingrad, because no one knows where our combat group is at the moment. They were pulled out of the ruins and reassigned somewhere else. We have to wait. He also tells us that the Schirmeister reckons that the vehicles will be able to get going, but he doesn't have enough fuel for all of them because for the last few weeks, there has been a big shortage of petrol and other supplies. Is it really that bad? Asks Meinhard. The Schirmeister shrugs his shoulders. No one knows anything for sure, but it could be that we'll have to move our vehicles out of here if we can't stop the Russians. In that case, sod it, says Seidel in his flippant style. We sleep uneasily. When I begin my guard duty at about 0500, I listen intently for any noise coming from the north in the dark. The wind brings muffled rolling noises to my ear, but no more than usual. If fighting is taking place near Kletskaya, we wouldn't be able to hear anything anyway because it's too far away. Or could it be that the breakthrough has been stopped by our own troops? 20. November. As daytime emerges, things get busy. We've never seen so many He-111 bombers and Ju-87 Stukas. In other words, something serious must be going on up north. The skies are filled with the roar of engines, and we can also hear a faraway rumbling noise. It increases hour by hour, becoming more distinct and swelling to a rolling thunder. It's coming from the north, where the Russians are supposed to have broken through. But soon we are also hearing it from the south as well. Something is happening down there. We are on full alert and are waiting. Some men are in their bunkers, others are, like me, standing on the top of the bunker waiting for whatever it is coming towards us. Alarm! Someone is yelling. Everybody out of the bunkers! We dash down into the bunkers, pick up our weapons and all our equipment, and struggle into it while we run back up again. Many have to go back down in the bunkers to pick up their winter coats. What's going on? You can read the questions in our faces. Then one of the drivers says that the Russians have also broken through the Romanian lines in the south and are coming at us from both sides, trying to take us in a pincer movement. Their tanks have already reached SETI, and we are supposed to hold them back. I suspect that things will now become serious for us and for everybody else around Stalingrad. We felt secure for the winter in our shelters and bunkers, but the rumbling has grown steadily right through into the night. Anybody who doubted what was happening now knows better. Even the most inexperienced soldier here realizes that we are about to be taken in a pincer movement. It's still quiet at the moment, but for how long? Is it the lull before the storm? 21 November. And so it proves. It begins in the early morning with the whining of heavy shells over our heads and their crackling explosions. Anybody still in his bunker runs out into his prepared position. But we see nothing. Their artillery are just firing to get the range, says the driver sitting beside me. Most of the rounds are landing to our right and further to the rear. Stalin Orgel rockets zoom overhead, landing near the Kolkhoz. Slowly it gets lighter and we can see a little better. In amongst the howling and the explosions we can now hear other noises, the droning of diesel engines and the squeaky clatter of tank tracks. Russian T-34s are circling round. They can see the situation better. Their shots ring out, making a harsh, metallic sound in the frosty air. The shells cut through the air with a swish, 
and explode on their targets. Often the shells hit the ground as hot glowing balls, only to ricochet with a swish, high into the air and then boring back into the ground. Tank shells, yells someone. Then the T-34s emerge from the haze. I count five of the steel giants. They are still some 100 meters away and moving only slowly. Their guns swivel, searching for targets. When they have found them, they fire. The artillery barrage is also increasing. Again, their targets seem to be to our side and behind us. The tanks are also firing there. Haven't they seen us yet? Or do they have a better target over there? Someone is creeping up behind us in the trench. It's Jansen, the truck driver. He is followed by two Russian volunteers bringing up ammunition. Jansen works his way over to Meinhard at the machine gun. I can hear what he's saying. Fuel has been provided and orders have been given to move all the trains out with all the vehicles over the bridge at Kalach towards the west. The Spies and Doring want to wait until nightfall because we've got no anti-tank support. Otherwise, the Russian tanks could knock us over like nine pins. Then, over our heads, we hear the deep droning noise of Russian combat aircraft. They drop their bombs and smoke billows up behind us. From the side, three small aircraft are diving down towards us. We can easily identify the Soviet star on the fuselages and wings. We stare towards the front. My nerves are fluttering. Everything is different compared to all the combat training. Various thoughts flash through my heat. The tanks in front of us are moving very slowly. I sneak over to Mainhard and peer through his field glasses. The soldiers look like dirty brown lumps of clay glued onto the white camouflage tanks as, for the first time, I see our enemies in front of me. A faint shudder goes through my body. If they get me, everything is over, because we have often heard in gruesome detail what they do to German soldiers. There is a mixture of excitement, fright, and rebelliousness about what could be happening to us. My mouth is dry, and I grip my carbine more tightly. Meinhard, who has carefully lifted his white chalked helmet over the edge of his trench, seems to think that they are moving towards the right, past us. They are at the receiving end of heavy fire from there. The stream in front of us stops and the infantry dismount. They would be much too far away for our machine guns and carbines. Maybe they have not even seen us. Our counterfire slackens and the tanks and infantry move almost parallel to us, further towards the right. We wait and watch. The enemy tanks go out of sight and the shooting dies down. The haze in front of us increases and slowly spreads over the white plain. We wait for a while longer, then comes the command, everyone to the vehicles and mount. We wait until the vehicles are out of their covered positions, and then we climb aboard. Go. We look round. We are a bit downcast. The bunkers were sort of shelter for us. We had got used to the straw bedding and the cracked clay walls. Now we are off into the cold across the hard, frozen snow with its great unknowns. The general direction is Kalach. The driver of the lead vehicle knows the way and has often driven it. In spite of our winter coats, we are freezing cold in the vehicle, even though, on Meinhard's suggestion, I have put on a second shirt and an extra pair of underpants. I am not alone in my misery. Our empty stomachs don't help. The body needs fuel. We received only cold rations this morning, but still haven't had time to eat. We try to eat now, but we abandon the idea of drinking anything as the coffee in our canteens is frozen solid. On the way, we meet up with other traffic, trucks, personnel carriers, motorcycles, jeeps, half-tracks with gun carriages and guns. They are all moving like we are, in great haste to escape something which we sense rather than see. Beside us, there are the remains of destroyed or defective vehicles. The Rollbun UVD recently dropped his parachute flares and his bombs and a quad anti-aircraft gun had finally chased him away. We are told about this by a driver who wants to jump up onto our vehicle. Warriors unceremoniously hauls him up. There are many others along the road who try to jump up on our vehicles. As we come to a rail line, we take another soldier on board. He says that his supply vehicle was hit not far from here, just about half an hour ago, by a shell from a T-34. His sergeant was killed immediately, and he was wounded in the head but had escaped on foot. It's about 10 kilometers to the Don Bridge at Kalach, he says. The vehicles which have converged on the bridge have built up into a huge traffic jam trying to get across. Everyone is pushing, and the traffic is barely creeping along. It'd probably be quicker to walk, but then, in the darkness and in confusion, we'd probably be hard put to find our places again. So we stay where we are and freeze. 
The other vehicles with During and the Spies are out of sight. 22 of November. In the morning, the fog lifts from the dawn, and a milky white veil slowly envelops the bridge. We have just made it across when we hear the harsh metallic report of a tank gun. A Russian tank is firing into the vehicles, which are making for the bridge ready to cross. We can only see the action as weak shadows. There are explosions. The 88mm AA gun has been hit, says Cooper, who has been sitting at the back all the way and can see a bit more clearly. The vehicles in front of us give fuel and drive into the mass ahead of us, which is getting ever thicker. We follow. After a few kilometers, we stop. Everything is quiet. We get down, walk around a bit to get the circulation back in our limbs, and wait. For what? For the other vehicles? In this fog, it would only be sheer luck if we found them again. We are now only three vehicles, the Schirmeister with his Steyr and four men and two Opel Blitz trucks with 14 men and three soldiers from other units. Our nerves are on edge. We are running beside the vehicle so that our feet don't get frozen. Stop. Turn the engines off. The Schirmeister orders a halt, gesturing to the other drivers. We can hear the sound of engines quite clearly now. They are pretty rough, and I reckon they are diesels. T-34s. Whispers the Schirmeister, who knows about these things? We must go back. We can't get through here. He whispers. The Russians are already across the Don and are blocking our way. We can also hear tank engines to the right of us. We assume that they are advancing in line. The noises disappear now and then, but they always come back. We start up our engines. They run smoothly, and we drive very slowly back. Two soldiers are leading the way and are waving our vehicles on. It is a nerve-wracking business, and I get the impression that we're going round in circles. At any moment, a Russian tank could be standing in front of us, his engine cut, ready to blow us to pieces. But he can't see in the mist any better than we can, and has to rely on what he can hear. That at least is something in our favor, though it's not much. Again, there are noises in front of us. A flare goes up. We keep stock still. Have they seen us? The light from the flare hardly penetrates the fog, giving it a ghostly appearance. The drivers immediately cut their engines. The yellowish light falls and is extinguished in the snow. Silence. My heart is pounding in my throat. Then a diesel starts up with a low droning noise. Tank tracks squeak, and slowly the tank moves and disappears to our left. Wow, that was a bit of luck but he is in the same situation as we are. It's possible he's hurt us, but for him too, it must have been scary. Where to now? Have we been driving around in circles? That's always a possibility in these conditions. We carry on driving at walking pace through the milky soup, just like before. Then one of the soldiers who has been walking ahead of us comes back, out of breath, to report that he has noticed a weak light from a fire or something to our side. We must assume that the Russians are there, and he suggests a recce. I am in the patrol. We creep very carefully in the direction of the suspect area. We don't see the red glare of the fire until we are quite close. The flames are flickering. In the fog, it looks as if it is burning in a hollow. The thick fog gives the illusion of walls. To right and left, the dark outlines of houses and barns appear. We glide over the snow, closer to the fire, and can make out several figures talking together. Then one of the soldiers beside me gives a start and blurts out happily, Thank God, they're ours. I too have recognized them by their language. It is the spies with During and two personnel carriers. Among the twelve men are Meinhard, Sweena, and the sick Stabskefreiter Petsch. Just like us, they have been fumbling around in the fog and then ended up here in the Kolkhoz. Where the rest of our vehicles have ended up, they don't know either. The Spies and some of the others discuss the matter. They agree that an advance party should try to find a gap. The vehicles will then move forward quietly as far as they can, and then make a run for it through the gap at full speed. We pray that the fog won't lift, otherwise it would be our undoing. After the fire has been put out, we slowly follow the advance party. We walk quietly beside the vehicles, in order to keep warm. I have to rub my eyes continually. The constant staring into the fog and the cutting cold is affecting my sight. Whenever we watch, we imagine figures in front of us and clutch our weapons that much more tightly. Then Russian voices can clearly be heard, coming from the left. Then there is a loud yell and a question. In response, a tank engine starts up with a droning noise. 
Then the engine of the Steyr screams into life and Jansen pushes the accelerator pedal of the Opel Blitz to the floor. Our truck leaps forward and then drives on. Then we hear the engines of our other vehicles to the right of us. We can see nothing in front of us. The milky mass is just like a wall. Driving across the bumpy step, we are thrown up to the canvas roof over the truck and hold on to the framework of the flatbed for all we are worth. We hope the truck won't break an axle. Behind us, we hear the sharp report of the tank gun firing. The rounds swish overhead. The T-34s are shooting blindly into the fog. It would have to be sheer luck if they were to hit us. We made it, yells Warriors, and all our pent-up excitement is released. Although we have broken through the tank barrier, the question still remains, are we out of the encirclement? The gunfire from behind has stopped, and Jansen eases his foot off the pedal as the engine has run hot. Where are we? And where are the others? We haven't seen anyone lately. The fog hasn't lifted at all. It's just as thick as ever, and we're swimming in the middle of it. We dismount again and walk about to warm our feet up. The snow crunches underfoot and we are leaving tracks all over the place. Grummel finds tire tracks from two vehicles. We follow them, and soon we come across the second Opel Blitz and the Steyr personnel carrier. The truck is hanging with a rear wheel over a hole on the rim of a Rachel. We hadn't thought of this problem. We ourselves could easily have ended up in one. We get the truck out of the hole and rest up in the next Rachel. Slowly the fog lifts. Behind us there is nothing but snow-covered step. We hear fighting in the distance. What now? No one knows. We were supposed to drive south to Nishna Chirskaya, an Obergefreiter reminds the Schirmeister. That's the village where the rear echelon supply vehicles were supposed to assemble after the Russian breakthrough. Okay, fine. Off to Nishne Chirskaya. A really disheartening feeling comes over me. I would prefer to just get off the vehicle and disappear, as many have already done. It's not that I am a coward, but the retreat from the Russians, the soldiers around me with their frightened, pale faces, many of them without weapons, all add up to a very uneasy feeling. Then there is the sight of the little lieutenant, plus who seems to be an administrative official or a teacher, and who, as the only officer, is probably now obliged to take on a job he is not up to. In his buttonhole he wears the red-striped ribbon of the so-called Gefrierfleisch Orden, plus plus, which was awarded to more or less everybody who survived the Russian winter campaigns of 1941 to 42. I assume he has no frontline experience, and everyone else sees it the same way. He divides us into groups and sends us out to secure the MSR using tank positions left over from earlier combat. What a situation. We have neither heavy weapons nor sufficient small arms or ammunition. The holes are partially filled with snow. I work with Cooper like a wild thing to clean up a tank shelter, just to keep warm. I have to give the lieutenant full marks because he has been able to scrounge a hot meal for us. We have no idea what it is. It is much too foggy and dark to tell, but it's made from meat and tastes delicious. In the next hole, Seidel starts to laugh. He thinks it's the old horse which we saw on the railway line earlier. This could be true, but in any case, this hot meal, the first in three days, tastes terrific. 23 the November. It's quiet this morning, although German bombers and fighters are up and about. A small, wiry infantry Unterofizier von der Infanterie, who has been assigned as our Gruppenführer, peers through his field glasses at the troops coming towards us. We expect a Russian attack, but as they get nearer we realize that they are, in fact, stragglers from our own forces. They join up with us, increasing our strength. Several more vehicles arrive, including a 75 millet anti-tank gun, a quad anti-aircraft gun from our regiment, which we can use for ground defense, and an 88 millimeters from an anti-aircraft gun battalion. Many of these men know each other and are pleased to meet up with friends again. We also have a stroke of good luck because the personnel carrier with Doring and the others reach us. They got lost in the fog and again ran into another tank. They kept their heads down for the entire night and first thing this morning they drove off as if the devil was after them. To our delight, our spice and two further vehicles, including our field kitchen, also reach us. Our unit is now well represented. From what we are told, some of our supply vehicles were able to make it across to the south side of the Don yesterday, 
and should even now be on their way to Nishna Chirskaya. A last-minute reprieve. During the early afternoon of 23rd November, our combat group was, surprisingly, reinforced by a larger pioneer, engineer unit under the leadership of a Hauptmann. They suddenly appeared in front of us from nowhere, driving forward a platoon of Russians they had taken prisoner while on the way over here to us. The unit came from a pioneer school which had been stationed near Kalach on the Don Heights. They were able, with a strength of nearly three companies, to save themselves from the T-34s. The experienced Pioneer Hauptmann takes over command of our combat group and brings some organization to the confused and demoralized men. It turns out that most of the demoralized soldiers and NCOs have no combat experience, while those in the Stalingrad area mainly served in supply, maintenance, and administrative units. Even though we, the replacement troops since October, also don't have much frontline experience, we are the best trained and armored unit and are well prepared for any serious incident. For that reason, we have the only combat-proven men, assistant machine gunners, assigned to us. During the breakthrough, they were either sick or on their way back from leave and were in the rear areas. I'm not particularly happy when a leader assigns me Obergefreiter Petsch, the one whose nerves have failed him, as my number two. Cooper is assigned as number two to Meinhard, who has the second MG-34 light machine gun in our squad. Our morale is boosted by the knowledge that most of the men in our unit will be taking up positions close to each other. In the meantime, we've been able to find out where we are. We're on the so-called Don Heights Road. Behind us is a village called Richkov. This lies directly on the Don and on the railway line to Chir and Stalingrad. A few kilometers to the southeast, there's an important railway bridge which crosses the Don. We can see this bridge clearly only if we use a field glasses. On the other side of the Don, there is reported to be another combat unit. Only a few kilometers west of us is Cheer Railway Station. Cheer has a fuel depot and other war supplies. Two drivers coming to us from this direction report that the Russians have already secured the area. We also learn from Meinhard that our combat unit has formed a bridgehead in order to stop the Russians securing the important railway line which leads to Stalingrad and the two bridges which lead south over the Don. For defense, we have one 88mm AA gun, two 75mm AT guns on mounts, and one quad AA gun for use against ground targets. The Pioneers have in addition several mortars and hollow charges for anti-tank work. Three tanks and another 88mm gun are supposed to be joining us. Hopes are raised more because a rumor is going around that General Oberst, Hoth and his 4th Tank Army is on his way to break the siege and the encirclement. With that, our situation here will also loosen up. This news and the slogans which follow, Soldiers, hang on. The Fuhrer will get you out. Improve morale only for a short while. We quickly realize that we are entirely dependent upon ourselves. Our early hopes disappear like the melting snow as soon as a shell explodes. The almost daily Soviet attacks and the constant fight to stay alive drain us visibly. To these privations must be added the hunger we suffer for days on end when no food can be delivered, forcing us to search through the dirty bread bags of dead Russians lying in front of us in order to find anything edible. Occasionally, they'd have more German rations on them than we'd ever been given. It's all very difficult, a time that I and the few who survive it will never forget. It's particularly demoralizing for us because, after the loss of our few AT weapons, no more replacements are available. What is more, contact with other combat units south of the Don is non-existent. 24 November. At about midday, one of the machine guns on our right flank suddenly starts hammering away. Then we hear rifle fire. The firing becomes more intense, and next we see Russian infantry appearing through the haze. I am meeting the enemy face to face for the first time, and, apart from an undeniable curiosity, also feel an enormous amount of nervousness and excitement. The brown, huddled figures remind me somehow of a great herd of sheep moving over a snow covered field. As soon as the herd comes under fire from us, they hesitate for a moment, move apart from each other, and then immediately move forward again. We are firing from all positions. Only our machine gun is silent. What is the matter? I have concentrated so fiercely on the Russians that I've paid no attention to Petsch. Why doesn't he shoot? His ammunition belt is in place. His machine gun is okay. Then I hear During call over, What's wrong, Petsch? Why don't you shoot? Yes, for God's sake. Why doesn't he shoot? Some of the enemy fall, hit by rifle fire and fire from Meinhard's machine gun, 
but the mass continues undeterred towards us. I am in a turmoil and feel fear in every part of my body. Why is Petch dabbling with his hands all over the machine gun instead of pulling the trigger? The questions are screaming out within me. His entire body is shaking as if in a fever, and the barrel of his machine gun is wandering backwards and forward. He's had it. His nerves are gone and he can't open fire. What should I do? I can't just push him away from the weapon and take his place. I still have too much respect for him. But every second is precious. Finally it happens. A burst of fire comes from the barrel. Every third bullet is a tracer round. The stream of light passes way over the heads of the attackers, disappearing into the haze. The next burst is also poorly aimed and goes high into the clouds. By now the attackers have located our machine gun. The bullets swarm around our heads and bury themselves in the embankment behind us. Petch suddenly yells out. He holds a bleeding ear and falls into the trench. Seidel, who has seen what has happened, looks after of him. This is my chance. I immediately get behind the machine gun and fire some short, carefully aimed bursts, just as I learned how. I aim into the mass of the advancing Soviet infantry. Grommel is now beside me, helping me by feeding in the ammunition belt. My aim is good, and several of the brown-clad figures fall to the ground. The waving mass stops for a moment, but then moves ahead, bent double, step by step, right for us. My mind goes blank. I only see the advancing stream of enemy soldiers coming directly at use. I again fire straight into it. Only fear is there. Fear of this dirty brown heap of destruction constantly moving closer, which wants to kill me and everyone around me. I do not even feel the burning pain on the inner surface of my right hand, which I have caught on the hot metal while changing barrels seconds after getting a jam. This is crazy. We are firing with four machine guns and at least 80 carbines from secure, covered positions into the advancing horde. Our machine gun bursts rip openings in their ranks. Dead and wounded are hitting the ground all the time. But more of them are coming through the haze, and we can't see them clearly. The first ones are now so close to our positions that we can readily make out the plump, bent figures with rifles and Russian Kalashnikovs. Then, suddenly, two of the machine guns on our right flank are silenced. Immediately the mass moves towards that flank from which they're now getting only rifle fire. Together with Meinhard, I continue to fire into it as it moves towards the right. Their move now becomes their undoing. The heavy, hard-hitting fire of the 20 mm quad anti-aircraft guns also comes as a surprise to us. Their bursts sound like low, regulated beats on a drum. We can see how the tracer rounds spew out of all four barrels and hit the middle of the attacking mass, tearing huge gaps in its ranks. Our two machine guns on the right flank start firing again. I assume that their silence was deliberate. The quad machine gun is now raking the attackers in front of us, and when it stops firing, stillness descends over the battlefield. We can hear calls and crying in Russian. I take a deep breath. The first battle with the enemy has affected me deeply, but now all my thoughts are working again. I raise my head out of the trench and peer into the field ahead. In front of us lie innumerable brown clumps on the snow. The quad's fabulous firepower still amazes me. I never imagined it would have an effect like that. The terrain in front of us is quiet, and I, in my innocence, believe that all the attackers are either dead or wounded. As I move a bit further out of my trench to get a better look, a Russian machine gun opens fire. The bullets zip around my ears. Then a second machine gun starts firing and spraying us. Shortly after this, I hear a sound that I recognize from Stalingrad, and the mortar rounds start landing all around. Mortars! Someone yells, and shortly afterwards, Doring and Markowitz are wounded. We need a medic. Someone calls back that the medic is on his way. I later discover that Gefreiter Markowitz, who was once a driver in our squadron, has taken a bullet through his shoulder and has had to be evacuated. Unteroffizier Doring, however, is only slightly injured on the cheek. At his own request, he stayed where he was. Petch has lost his right ear. We're all delighted when they bring him back to the village. The mortar fire is so intense that we dare not stretch our heads over the trenches. But then, we hear the familiar plop of our own mortars. The pioneers have moved into position and are now beginning their own counterfire. Their rounds rise up and over us and are exploding somewhere in the haze where, it is assumed, the enemy is located. Gingerly, I raise myself out of my trench in order to watch what is going on, and I cannot believe my eyes. 
Many of the brown lumps, which I thought were dead or wounded, are now standing up and are moving off. Under cover of their own machine gun and mortar fire, they are retreating. Warius has also realized this, and he calls out from the neighboring hole, Hey, the Russians are leaving. Now our mortar rounds are landing right in the middle of the retreating Russians. For the quad machine gun crews, either the range is too great, or they are saving their ammunition for later. It's not long before the Russians have disappeared in the fog. I have just filled my pipe with tobacco when the order to counterattack comes. We are to clear the area in front of our positions and stay on the heels of the Soviets for a while longer. Before I jump out of my hole and throw the machine gun, ready to fire over my right shoulder, I light my pipe and take a couple of deep drags. Tobacco never tasted so good, and it feels as if I have gained new strengths. We fan out on a broad front and get only sporadic counterfire. We fire back and move slowly forward. Close behind, the quad machine gun follows on its carriage. As we get to the fallen Russians, we discover that the wounded have been taken away. For the first time, I see the dead enemy in front of me. The bodies are lying spread out over the snow and sometimes close together, just as they fell. Wearing thick coats, they are either stretched out or bent over. Red puddles of blood are frozen on the snow. My stomach is churning, and I cannot bring myself to look at their colorless faces. Now, for the first time, when I see the lifeless bodies before me, my consciousness really grasps the meaning of death. As a young person, you tend to push these thoughts far away from you, but here there is no way to escape them. These people are our enemies, but, even so, they are flesh and blood, just like us. And just as they are lying here now, so could I or some of us be lying here dead and motionless in this ice-cold snow. I glance over at Grummel, who is carrying two ammunition boxes for me. The poor chap is as white as a sheet, and his eyes are staring towards the front, so as to avoid looking at the corpses. The others are doing the same. Cooper, Wilk, and I go up to a dead soldier who only has a bloody half of his head left because the other half was probably torn away by an exploding shell. Wilka turns away, just as I do, while Cooper has to summon all his strength to stop himself throwing up. For us newcomers, the first view of a dead body gives a feeling of confusion, fright, and helplessness, unless perhaps someone is of such a robust character and is so insensitive to human feelings that he is not affected. Someone like the little black unteroffizier von der Infanterie, who looks like a gypsy. His name is Schwartz, and I saw him two days ago in position on the MSR. I met up with him again here, as Grommel and I were advancing against the weak but still dangerous enemy fire, behind some flat ground rising over on our left flank. While we were here, we also stumbled across a circular-shaped earthwork. Round a center circle dug out fairly deep in the ground was another rim dug down to the height of a man. Meinhardt had mentioned these features while we were still in our defensive positions. He said that while the division was advancing, they used them for their artillery and anti-aircraft guns, and we could now expect the Soviets to use them for themselves. This was obviously correct, for scattered around there were a number of dead Soviet soldiers. This is when I hear this black unteroffizier tell a soldier to shoot a crumpled figure in the head. He himself had the muzzle of his submachine gun against the back of another soldier's head. Both shots sound muffled and unpleasant, much as if one had shot into a sack. I was shocked, and I shuddered. Is the man so full of hate that he even has to dishonor the dead? After this, he walks past me towards another fallen soldier. He kicks the body, which is lying on its side, really hard in the stomach, and mutters angrily, This one, too, is still alive. He places his barrel directly on the forehead of the soldier and fires. The body which I had assumed to be dead, convulses. After the retreat from the cauldron of Stalingrad to the defensive positions near Richov, up to 13 December 1942. Why don't we take them prisoner? I ask him angrily. The black sergeant just looks at me in disgust and growls, then just try to get them up when they are playing dead. The swine think we won't realize they're alive and will cut us down from behind. I've seen it before. How can I answer him? I'm still not conversant with all the underhanded things that are done in warfare, but I would never shoot at any unarmed soldier, even if it was to my personal disadvantage. What I consider unworthy and terrible, the unteroffizier only looks upon as a safety measure for our own protection. He simply says, him or us.
Nevertheless, I can't bring myself to fire if I am not attacked, and I don't intend ever to change my mind. Grommel is also upset, and so he presses on, and I have to hurry to catch up with him. All the time I can hear these muffled shots to the head, and they really shake me to the marrow. Although this Unterofizier may have a very logical argument, I still reckon a large part of his thinking comes from his rather sadistic nature, which such people can satisfy in time of war, under the pretext of legitimacy. Meinhard says that the Soviets commit atrocities on our soldiers, and often do not take prisoners. So our side behaves in the same manner. He says this is the way of war, with its constantly increasing avalanches of hate. It begins with an attack, and then combat. The two enemies fight for their lives, and it develops into grim determination and overreaction from both sides. That leads to revenge and retaliation, in accordance with the motto, As you do unto me, so I do unto you. Oh, and heaven help the loser. I've never heard Meinhard speak like this before, but I suppose he's right. I haven't been in the war long enough to be able to form an opinion. Our counterattack is over as we arrive at the jumping-off point of the Soviet attack. The enemy has, in the meantime, withdrawn far behind these positions, so we take them over, keeping on the alert. After dark, we are given hot coffee and our rations. The vehicles take five wounded back to the village. On one of the vehicles are one dead and one slightly wounded soldier. We don't know either man. Some of the soldiers tell us that they have found German rations and cigarettes in the Soviet soldiers' kit bags. On the wrist of a commissar, they also found a German Tila wristwatch with a name inscribed under the second lid. The driver from the supply vehicle will give them to the Pioneer Hauptmann. We spend the night in the new positions. It's bloody cold, and an icy easterly wind penetrates into our very bones. Anyone not on watch at an observation post sits huddled in his cold foxhole and dozes until morning. 25 November. Even before it gets light, we have orders to board our vehicles. We make for the village and reoccupy the old positions and trenches scattered around on the steppe. That saves us a lot of hard work, because the ground is frozen so hard in the top layers that you can only break up the soil with picks. In good weather, we can see for many kilometers across the steppe, but unfortunately in some places the enemy can also see into our trenches. We have almost daily incidents involving snipers hitting our men. These snipers are extremely well hidden, and we have a very hard time seeing them. Rations and ammunition supplies are therefore always brought in at night, although even then it's dangerous. We assume that the snipers are aiming their rifles at the critical points during the daylight hours and then occasionally pulling the triggers also at night. It is quiet at first this morning, but later on, the Soviets launch an attack on Cheer Station with tanks and infantry. To begin with, we were only spectators to the action, but then we were also attacked with mortars and machine guns. The enemy came for us very suddenly, as if they had risen out of the ground. We learned later from prisoners that they had crawled up to within only a few hundred meters of us and had dug themselves in under the protection of a small hillock. The breezy easterly masked any noise made by their digging. While we hold down the infantry in front of us with aimed fire, a T-34 tank leaves its formation of five and comes at us from the other side of the Rachel, firing continuously. He stops at the edge of the Rachel with his broadside towards us. I've never seen an enemy tank this close before, and it looks very menacing. It has white camouflage paint and its steel turret swings round as the gun is lowered towards a target. The thundering shot shakes it up a bit, and there is a small jet of flame from the muzzle followed by a brief smoke trail. The hit behind us registers at just about the same second. Then the powerful diesel engine revs up and the monster moves off, its tracks clanking along the edge of the Rachel. I'm showered with debris. Just don't get spotted. He knows that we're lying here, but maybe he hasn't noticed our well-camouflaged bunker. He must have realized that we haven't got any anti-tank weapons here in this sector. In spite of this, he moves carefully before he drives through the flat swell at the end of our Rachel before entering it. One shot from an AT or 88 millimeter AA gun would knock him, he is standing with his broadside towards us, but I know full well that our AT weapons are guarding the railway line in the village. Suddenly he backs up and tries to turn, but he doesn't manage it very well, and then puts a track on the edge of the Rachel, causing bits of it to break off. Now I can see some pioneers in the Rachel. They're working with something, 
It looks like a bar or a pole. Then I'm interrupted by Weichert, who is beside me and is making me aware of the infantry who have advanced under the protection of the tank. What should I do? Shoot. Yes, I have to. Otherwise, they will overrun us, even if it means that the T-34 will discover our position. I squeeze myself behind the machine gun and pull the trigger. Weichert feeds in the belt. At about the same time, Meinhard and the others also fire at the attacking infantry. The first row of men falls to the ground and the others throw themselves down. There is no cover for them on the snow-covered step. What is the tank doing? He has spotted us and is turning his turret towards us. Then he lowers his gun and aims directly at us. He is barely 50 meters away. It would be crazy to stand there and fire. So I pull down the machine gun from its position and cover myself with the others in the trench. The resulting explosion is mixed with shrapnel as the shell strikes home just meters behind us. This time we were fortunate, but next time we'll have had it, says Weishert. A chill runs down my spine. Sweena brings relief from the terrible excitement. The tank is destroyed, he calls out. We move up and can see that the tank is hanging over the edge of the Rachel with a broken track. From the rear of the vehicle comes thick, black smoke, which quickly dissipates. Someone calls out, the pioneers got him with a hollow charge. We breathe more easily and are grateful to the men in the pioneer unit. Later, the Unteroffizier der Pioneer tells me it was a piece of cake because the T-34 didn't notice them under the edge of the Rachel and had positioned itself directly over them so they could attach their homemade charge of hand grenades under the track quite easily. Even so, they were almost killed by the broken bits of track. Today, we have been fairly fortunate. The tank fire caused only three lightly wounded. The pioneers were forced to smoke the crew out. They had kept still for hours inside their vehicle hoping for rescue by their own people. They crawl out and I take a look at them. I have a strange feeling, a mixture of curiosity, threat, and respect. I'm quite surprised to see their helmets, which can best be described as a number of blown-up bicycle inner tubes sewn together, one next to the other. What purpose they serve, I don't know. Perhaps they're a form of sound insulation and a protection against the cold. 26 November. Today begins with ground fog. It dissipates in the winter sun, giving us good fields of views. German bombers, accompanied by fighter escorts, drone around unmolested in the clear blue, cloudless sky. Grommel identifies them as He-111s and Do-17s. I have often seen the slim Mi-109s, the escort fighters, in air combat. Once in a while, we also recognize the Heavy Jew 52, the so-called Tante Jew, which is used for freight and as a troop transport. All of them are flying heavily loaded to Stalingrad, and when they are lucky, they come back empty. Wariaz and Suina were down in the village early to get clean underwear and lice powder from our kit bags. The little beasts have multiplied incredibly quickly on me, and I have already rubbed my entire upper torso. Wariaz says that two days ago the Fuhrer declared Stalingrad to be a fortress. Some of the soldiers, those who were in Stalingrad, are furious when they hear it. They are angry at the way the war is being conducted and because they are no longer given any opportunity to escape the encirclement. They speak quite openly of being sacrificed in a pocket which is surrounded by an enemy force superior to any before. Others believe the encirclement will shortly be breached by the approaching tank units commanded by General Oberst Hoth. I and most of the reserve unit personnel believe the latter. However, this optimism is built on wishful thinking, and it falls to pieces like a pack of cards. As even the lowliest soldier knows, the combat strength of our enemy grows steadily day by day, while we, with our inadequate weaponry, become weaker. Added to this come the days when we are only able to satisfy our rumbling stomachs with a handful of hearts we back. It is not lost on anyone that we remain here in a totally isolated outpost and are to be sacrificed for some strategic purpose or other. It will be at the beginning of December, only a question of days away, when Soviet superiority will grind us to pieces. On the afternoon of this day, 26 November, we have, however, received a boost to our morale in the form of an 80 mm anti-aircraft gun, which is to be used in the ground defense role. We also get a 20 mm quad AA gun on a wheeled carriage. Before the 80 mm is taken into position on the hillock, the ground is dug out so that only a little of the white painted protective shielding of the gun can be seen from the front. As of yesterday, there are supposed to be three tanks in the village to give support. 
but because of a shortage of ammunition, they are to be used only in an absolute emergency. 27th November. During the early hours, an enemy reconnaissance patrol is able to gain entry into the village. We hear the gunshots. The emergency response unit manages to take some prisoners. Afterwards, the Soviets pound the village for hours with heavy artillery. During the morning, we're also bombarded with mortars in Stalin Orgon. However, they do not attack. Yesterday, the pioneers mined part of the village, but unfortunately, one of our drivers, in a personnel carrier, ran onto one of the mines and was blown into the air. Because of the heavy shelling, we are sitting like moles in the ground for much of the time, occasionally checking to see whether the enemy has started his attack yet. It is my turn to keep watch, and I carefully raise my head up over the lip of the trench, but just then, a grenade explodes right on the edge. The hot splinters zip past my head, and my ears ring like mad. Dirt and debris rain down on heads and down the necks of those in the trench. But the roof holds. The snow around us has for the last few hours been no longer white, but rather mixed in with brown dirt because of all the explosions. It is bloody hard, and wearing, to sit in a hole in the ground and wait. What for? No one knows exactly, only that it is about our lives. That much we know for sure. Maybe we will take a direct hit, which will end what little is left of our lives. When that happens, we'll probably not notice anything. It would be bad enough if the enemy were attacking en masse. At least you can defend yourself. But here, in this awful hole, you can do nothing except wait. I try to think about other things, but can't. The howling and the crashing explosions over and around us Banish all other thoughts, and there is only the fervent wish that this nerve-wracking din will finally stop. The only person seemingly unaffected is Sweena. I can't see excitement and fear in his face like I can with the others. But then, how could he feel these emotions? The poor devil can't hear the crashes and the whining of the shells. He looks at us unconcernedly and asks us what we're doing. To talk to him, you must go right up to him and shout, then he understands. The artillery barrage lasts almost two hours, proof that they do not have to be too sparing with their ammunition. They haven't achieved much. Apart from a damaged machine gun and a filled-in trench, there's no harm done. 28th of November. The night of 27 to 28. November passes quietly, but Meinhard brings bad news early in the morning. He says that our Spies and another Wachtmeister from the unit fell yesterday morning. Although we weren't that close to our Wachtmeister, he always kept his distance from us newcomers. We were still pretty shocked. What's more, he was our linchpin and our superior, and in spite of his serious nature, he always concerned himself with our well-being, as much as he was able to here in the bridgehead anyway. Now, he is among us no more. There are only two service grades left in our company, the Schiermeister and Unterofficier During. Meinhard says that in peacetime the Spies served with the cavalry, and that the job of the soldier was made for him. It doesn't seem to get all that light today. It stays hazy and cloudy, and the visibility is so bad that we have to be really careful in case the enemy suddenly looms up in front of us. During therefore sends several men to man the observation posts up ahead. Meinhard reckons that the Soviets will make use of the weather to get up close to us. As it turns out, he's right. Shortly after this, the observers come back to report that they've heard noises coming from the north and have heard commands in Russian getting louder and louder. They hadn't, however, been able to see anything, but there is no doubt that the enemy is on his way from the north. They hadn't heard any tank engines. Okay, so it's the infantry first. We're ready, and we'll give them a warm welcome. During sends word that we will open fire only on his command. He intends to let them come close, to within a certain range, and then take them by surprise with crossfire. We are standing with our weapons and getting excited. No one knows what will come at us. These are the worst minutes before combat, when everything in your body is at the highest level of excitement. The minutes become eternities. Then, they're here. The first figures approach, bent double, out of the haze, coming right for us. Everyone's waiting for the signal to fire. Pity I don't have any field glasses, because something seems odd, something that I can't quite understand. Someone yells, those are our boys, don't fire. Then during, keep your heads down, everyone stay down. We do as we're told and keep looking. The soldiers in front of us are coming closer, and I can see those in front waving. Where have they come from, I am thinking, because their uniforms and steel helmets appear so new? 
Then Meinhard's machine gun hammers away and someone is yelling, They're Russians, in our uniforms. The figures in the German uniforms are storming forward in an attempt to overrun us. Behind them come the others, in mud-brown overcoats and dirty camouflage uniforms. We lay down crossfire from all our machine guns and carbines. Those who have not been hit throw themselves to the ground. The attack stops. In front of us, we hear shouts. Then two Soviet machine guns let loose. A rain of bullets comes towards us and mortar rounds explode all over the place. Another centimeter and one of them would have taken out my machine gun. I pull it back and crouch down. They are attacking again, calls Weikert as he feeds another belt of ammunition in. It's a weird sensation firing on an enemy wearing your own uniform. It's as if you're shooting traitors. They are trying to overrun us in a second and third wave, but they don't make it, especially when the pioneers fire at them from the flank. There are an awful lot of dead bodies lying around on the snow in front of us, which are gradually freezing solid and getting covered by whirling snowflakes. We can hear the wounded groaning and calling out for help, but we can't do anything for them. Some of the dead even have German felt boots on, which we ourselves are in desperate in need of. Where possible, these are removed from the stiff, frozen feet of the dead and put to use again. I can't find a pair to fit me, and so I keep my own boots on. Many of the soldiers even help themselves to the primitive ear flaps the Russians are wearing. They seem to be made out of a single piece of pressed felt, but they serve their purpose in the cold. My boots were too large during the summer, but if I hadn't put on an extra pair of very thick socks and placed some newspaper wadding in the boots, my toes would undoubtedly have got frostbite at the start of the winter, like so many other people's did. For this reason, a couple of days ago, we received some rather unpretentious-looking overshoes made out of woven straw, which Sweena dubbed Stropotchen. Although we can't take very big strides when we're wearing them, they do insulate our feet quite well against the cold ground when we are standing around in our foxholes. Weikert and some of the others are also checking the kit bags of the dead Soviet soldiers, as we have not received any rations since yesterday evening other than a piece of army bread and half-warm tea. Weikert suffers from hunger more than any of us. He finds some black Russian army bread and some pieces of smoked meat, which also originate from German supplies. Sweena brings a large bag of machorka for me, as he has noticed that I've been turning my pockets inside out all morning to salvage a pinch of tobacco for my pipe. Tonight, we again place the observation posts way out ahead. When Grommel wakes us at about Oro 300, it is quite cozy in the bunker. But to make up for that, very much colder outside. Everything is covered with rime because of the fog. The machine gun, wrapped in a canvas ground sheet, appears as a white, indeterminate lump. Behind us on the hillock, a flare goes up. The view from there is better. The fog is thicker in the hollow in front of us. Often we can't even see our hands in front of our faces. I trudge with Sweena into the haze. The snow crunches under our boots and we follow the tracks. Then comes a muffled request for the password. Railway, I answer quietly. Come over here. I hear a voice which seems to be familiar, but I can't see anybody. We are to your right in the foxhole, says the voice. Then suddenly a figure stands in front of us and another is climbing out of the foxhole. Damn this thick fog. If they had not challenged us, we might have stepped on them. They report that it's been quiet out front. As soon as the fog has swallowed them up, Sweena leaps into the foxhole. I still need to orient myself a bit. I'm only a few meters away from Sweena, but I can't hear or see anything of him. I only know roughly where he should be. Bloody fog. I stumble over a dead body and realize that I am too far out front. I do not feel very well and crouch down as I think I can hear crunching footsteps. More dead bodies are scattered around. An uncanny feeling is coming over me, and I am regretting that I left Sweena. I can't call him because he can't hear me, but again I hear those crunching footsteps and muffled voices. Soviets! The thought flashes before me. Now don't panic, I think. My nerves are stretched to the limit. I reckon the Russians often stand around and then call to each other. They manage to keep in contact with each other in the thick fog in this way. Slowly I back away from the noises and almost step on Sweena's head. For him, it must be an awful feeling to be unable to see or hear in the fog. I indicate to him that something is happening in front of us, and it seems almost grotesque when he cups his hand and places it behind his ear to listen. We then creep back and tell the others. We wait until we can hear the voices quite clearly. 
Then during fires off a flare, it lights up only a small area, cold and ghost-like. Some figures stand stiff and immobile as if with roots in the ground. Then suddenly they disperse. The first ones throw themselves onto the ground. We fire into the darkness. The Russians are yelling something to each other. Then we hear some clatter, which retreats rapidly. A second and then a third flare go up. Five figures are still lying on the snow, the others have disappeared. We assume they are from a Soviet reconnaissance unit or men who have lost their way. It's only a small group. We fire a few rounds. In the light of another tracer, I see two figures leap up and run back. One is hit and falls down. Three are still lying in the snow. Someone from our side is calling out something in Russian. It must be one of our Russian volunteers who was with the supply trains and now is helping us. A Russian is answering him, then stands up and raises his hands. The other two follow him. Among the three prisoners are two women, which we refer to as Flintenweiber. They are said to be more fanatical even than the Soviet soldiers. They do not have much to hide and say they got lost in the fog with a group of 15 soldiers. We are well aware of their front lines and also of the fact that their positions are being strengthened day by day. Second of December. After thick morning fog, it is now clearing up. There is considerable enemy activity in the direction of Cheer Station. I walk along the trench towards Meinhard's position. He has been talking to Doering, who has been scanning with his field glasses. Doering thinks the Soviets are preparing for an attack, says Meinhard. He has seen lots of vehicles and tanks. Apparently, they are moving replacements in by transport. Meinhard is annoyed that the Russians have the audacity to form up in front of us, calm as you like. Those swine know full well that we have no artillery, otherwise they would never have the cheek, he grumbles. We watch the enemy for another hour. Then we realize that the bulk of their formation is moving southeast towards Verchnichirskia. Another combat unit is supposed to be securing the bridge over the Don. When the Russians take the bridge, they will be in our rear and will have us in the bag. The flashes tell us that their attack is supported by well-equipped tank units. Three of these dreadful steel monsters are coming along the railway line towards us right now. Suddenly there are loud engine noises overhead. Our Stukas are here! Some of the soldiers cry out excitedly. The stress and anxiety within us is vanishes in a trice, and we start cheering like children who've just opened a present. So there is some contact with high command after all. Can it have come from the south bank of the Don? Only later do I find that there is in fact no connection. The pilots had realized what was going on from the air and had acted accordingly. Later, Stuka support is again carried out without any reference to us. Nevertheless, each time they come, they are greeted excitedly, and they help lift our spirits, if only temporarily. First, there is flight of three Stukas, which dive down, then three more follow. Their attack in front of us is a real spectacle, but, even for us non-participants, it brings a cold, creepy feeling to the spine. The fearsome shark mouths painted on the engine cowlings give the enemy a premonition of the catastrophe that is about to be visited on them. The aircraft first roll to the side, then with the deafening wail from their sirens getting louder and louder, swoop down on their target. As soon as they have released their bombs, the planes climb steeply, only to dive again on another target. The effect on the morale of those on the receiving end must be terrible. It is just like the inferno of hell, even though the action is taking place far away from us. Within the next few minutes, black clouds of smoke billow into the clear sky. We notice that some of the tanks are moving in zigzag fashion to escape the attacking dive bombers. They don't really have a chance because the Stukas are over them again and again, sending their bombs down. When they have dropped their bombs, the aircraft turn and disappear over the horizon. Smoke clouds, large and small, show how many targets were hit and destroyed, mostly vehicles, tanks, and heavy weapons. The Stukas have accomplished a great deal, and the Russian infantry has been halted by the combat group south of the Don. We can quite clearly see that the Don Bridge has not been captured by the enemy. But how long will things last? 3rd December. The ration orderlies bring us thin, cold coffee, which we first have to heat on the stove. Each four men receive half a can of beef and a canteen full of zwieback. That has to last until tomorrow evening. Grommel counts out each mouthful of Zwieback so that everyone receives exactly the correct amount. It is more than we received yesterday when we got one loaf of bread, already mildewed, among three men. 
Typically during this period of the war, hunger so completely dominates our thinking that even the constant worry about our survival takes a back seat. The main topic of conversation is food. Even at night I dream about food and even dream about a delicious roast being cooked in the oven. Waking up is therefore that much more difficult, particularly when I discover that the noise is only a loud rumble in my empty stomach. Our lives are re-energized when we get enough dry army bread to eat. I chew it slowly in my mouth and savor the exquisite taste. I would even forego the best cakes. I would never have thought bread could be so delicious. But on many days, even bread is unavailable. It is taken for granted in normal times, but it's really precious now.